Äh, ja, guten Abend. Ich möchte Sie ganz herzlich wieder bei einer Simon Wiesenthal Lektion begrüßen. Und ich glaube, wir machen jetzt einen protokollarischen Fehler. Nämlich, ich glaube, es müsste der Haus sehr begrüßen. Und ich freue mich ganz besonders, Dr. Wohnert begrüßen zu dürfen, obwohl das in seinem eigenen Haus passiert und wir sozusagen hier nur Gast sind. Äh, Dr. Wohnert ist der neue Generaldirektor des österreichischen Staatsarchivs. Und das österreichische Staatsarchiv, und wir haben das jetzt ausgerechnet, es ist im Juni 2010 waren wir das erste Mal hier. Wir haben die erste Simon Wiesenthal Lecture damals hier gehalten, eben mit der großzügigen Unterstützung äh, des österreichischen Staatsarchivs. Wir sind auch sehr, sehr dankbar dafür, dass wir hier zehn Jahre, und es ist einmal eine Simon Wiesenthal Lecture wegen des Wetters ausgefallen, nicht wegen Viren oder wegen irgendwas, sondern wegen des Wetters. Äh, das war das einzige Mal. Heute ist die 73. Simon äh, Wiesenthal Lecture, zu der sie dann Eva Kovac und, äh, vorstellen wird, unseren heutigen Gast, Darius Stola äh, aus Polen. Äh, die Idee, diesen Raum zu haben, um das ganz kurz vorzustellen, warum wir eigentlich hier sind, ist ein reiner Zufall. Ich habe damals äh, beim Wien Museum für eine Ausstellung gearbeitet über das Wien der 1930er Jahre. Sie wissen, hier ist das Bundeskanzleramt. Im Bundeskanzleramt äh, wurde im Juli 1934 äh, der österreichische Bundeskanzler ermordet. Wir hatten dann Führungen im Rahmen dieser Ausstellung und im Rahmen dieser Ausstellung äh, oder im Rahmen dieser Führungen wurde mir auch dieser Raum gezeigt. Ich war gerade frisch gebackener Leiter des Wiener Wiesenthal-Instituts und habe sozusagen gleich zugeschlagen, weil ich diesen Raum so toll gefunden habe. Und inzwischen gibt es eine Legende dafür, warum wir diesen Raum benutzen. Das ist ein bisschen so eine Sinone Vero e Bien Trovato. Das heißt, wir haben hier dann gesagt, der Holocaust wurde in der österreichischen Geschichte lange Zeit an die Peripherie gedrängt. Er wurde nicht beachtet, er wurde verdrängt. Und jetzt kommen wir her mit dieser Geschichte des Holocaust, mit den Holocaust-Studien eigentlich in das Zentrum der österreichischen Macht. Wir befinden uns nämlich im Haus äh, des Bundeskanzleramtes. Das ist zwar die Rückseite, aber es ist trotzdem das Haus des äh, Bundeskanzleramtes hier am Ballhausplatz. Und mit diesen Worten, um Ihnen ein bisschen auch die Geschichte zu erzählen, warum wir hier sind, übergebe ich und noch einmal ganz, ganz herzlichen Dank für diese unheimlich wichtige Gastfreundschaft. Und wir sind ja übereingekommen, dass wir weiter hier bleiben dürfen. Also stoßen wir an auf die nächsten zehn Jahre. Vielen Dank. Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, ich denke, das ist schon in Ordnung, dass äh, der Herr Kollege Haschke beginnt. Ähm, wir sind ja hier bloß Kooperationspartner gemeinsam mit dem äh, Dokumentationsarchiv des österreichischen Widerstands und dem Institut für österreichische Zeitgeschichte für Öst der Universität Wien. Ähm, ich freue mich aber darüber und ich denke, dass es eine sehr bewährte Kooperation ist, die sich hier über zehn Jahre entstanden ist und ein gutes Format, das einfach hier besteht, im, ja, im Zentrum Wiens. Und äh, ich habe mir dann doch gedacht, um Ihnen das zu zeigen, als neuer Generaldirektor möchte ich einfach äh, die ehestmögliche Gelegenheit nützen um persönlich hierher zu kommen, weil das einfach äh, mehr sagt als viele Worte. Äh, ich freue mich, hier zu sein. Ich möchte vielleicht einen einzigen äh, ganz kurzen Gedanken noch sagen. Ich freue mich besonders, dass, dieses, äh, dass hier ein Institut, dessen Namensgeber Simon Wiesenthal ist, äh, mit unserer Kooperationspartner ist. Ich habe es dem Herrn Dr. Raschke erzählt. Ich habe sozusagen zwei auch persönliche Bezugspunkte zu Simon Wiesenthal. Ich hatte im Jahr 1985, ich war damals 21 Jahre alt, die Gelegenheit, Simon Wiesenthal persönlich kennenzulernen. Ich habe eine Diskussion mit ihm, mit Studenten moderieren dürfen. Er war eine, damals für einen 21-Jährigen sehr beeindruckende Persönlichkeit. Und ich bin... Äh, ja bis zum Vorjahr äh, nicht nur Historiker, sondern auch Beamter im Bundeskanzleramt gewesen. Und als solcher war ich als äh, sozusagen äh, wohl am wenigsten prominenter Teil der österreichischen Regierungsdelegation, die beim Begräbnis Simon Wiesenthals im Jahr 2005 in Herzliya war. Auch das ein Ereignis, das ich wohl mein Leben lang äh, nicht vergessen werde. Äh, 
Und Simon Wiesenthal hat eben diese zwei Punkte seines Lebens, Gerechtigkeit für die Opfer und Warnung für die kommenden Generationen, das hat er einfach mit seiner ganzen Persönlichkeit verkörpert. Und wenn man die Gelegenheit hatte, ihn kennenzulernen, wird sich das sicher, war das sicher etwas, was sich lebenslang äh, einprägt. Äh, jetzt aber äh, freue ich mich auf Ihren Vortrag. I'm, I'm curious and looking forward to your paper. And please, Professor Kovac, I think you will introduce. Thank you so much. So, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, this is my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, uh, Professor Darius Stola here. Um, Professor Stola is, a histo uh, Stola is a historian, professor at the Institute of Political Science at uh, the uh, Polish Academy of Sciences. And uh, as you probably know, he has authored uh, many books and also co-edited very important books in Poland and published more than 100 um, scholarly articles. And we also uh, did a lot of work in, uh, in um, public history in Poland uh, and uh, a lot about Polish Jewish relations and the Holocaust and international migrations and also something about the said the dictature in Poland, so the communist regime. Um, so as we see, he has uh, an extensive experience in research, teaching, and academic management. Um, and because we, we, we come from the same generation, I would like to start the introduction with a very important uh, notice, uh, uh, because Darius uh, was a, jour a journalist with, uh, between 1986 and 1989, uh, and also an editor of, uh, of the Samizdat um, um, journal, Vola. Uh, and he wrote a lot about the the, the Solidarność movement uh, and also in the Reflexi, a student bulletin uh, about the activities of the democratic opposition. Uh, he started his career as a doctoral student in October 1988 in the Institute of History uh, at, the, at the Polish Academy of Sciences. And as we see, he's still there, so he's a, he's a decent Polish conservative scholar with a lot of, uh, lot of um, 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 inspiration to do something in his, in his old institute. Um, he was awarded many times. Among um, these, he received uh, the honorary membership uh, award by the Polish so uh, Society of the Righteous Among the Nations in 2018. And at the same, in the same year, he also received the uh, uh, Medal of uh, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising Award <laughs> the Jewish Veterans Association for Contribution to Commemorations of the Uprising and the History of the Polish Jews in 2016. And he also received, uh, in 2002, the Ministry, Ministry of Culture Award for his distinguished service to Polish culture. Uh, he is also the academic board member, among others, the Fortunov uh, video archive of, uh, for Holocaust uh, testimony at Yale University. Uh, the Wiesenthal Institute has also a cooperation uh, uh, with this institute. We always have a scholar, uh, a fellow from Fortunov Archive Nights, uh, Nikolaus Hagen. Welcome. Uh, and uh, that is just also a member of the academic board in European Network Remembrance and Solidarity, which is a European network, um, and it, which is also important in Vienna. He is also a board member in the Institute for Human Sciences, Vienna. Um, he is also active in uh, editorial works uh, in the Eastern European Politics and Societies, the Central and Eastern European Migration Review, and the Journal of Migration History, and I just listed a couple of uh, his activities. Uh, on the 12th, 12th of June, 2014, Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet, at that time Program Director of Polin, gave here a beautiful lecture with the title Rising from the Rubble, creating the Museum of the History of Polish Jews. In the same year, Darius started his career as the director of the Poly Museum uh, of the History of Polish Jews. After five years, he had to leave this museum. And I'm sure that this evening we will learn more about the broader context of this new, 
developments. So welcome, Darius. Thank you very much, Eva, for this generous introduction. Uh, she hasn't mentioned that I also sing beautifully. <laughs> uh, uh, it's a honor for me to offer to you this Vizenta lecture in this beautiful uh, building. Uh, I will try to uh, give you these aspects of the long history of Polish coming to terms with the Holocaust, which I believe to be important. I am lucky to stand on the shoulders of many colleagues who have made research, especially since the debates on the Holocaust in Poland became very intensive in the 21st century. We have a number of studies, collections of, of various articles and studies and colleagues from not only from Poland but also from other countries were analyzing it. So it's relatively easy to, uh, to offer you various insights. It was actually more difficult to select some of them um, this is a problem of a, of a field of research where you have many people working and, and exploring. And so first, please let me note that uh, debates of the Holocaust is something normal in Europe. You have certainly heard of the German historical strike, the French debates of the Vichy collaboration, uh, the deportation of, of, of the Jews from France, probably about the Swiss bankers' problems with the assets of the victims of the Holocaust, maybe less about Sweden and Norway problems of this kind, probably not about discussions in Lithuania and Romania, maybe about some discussions in Hungary, about the Holocaust in Hungary and about the commemoration of the Holocaust in Hungary in particular. And uh, when I was preparing for this lecture, uh, I actually found that there was a kind of a debate practically everywhere in Europe, from Portugal, even in Vatican, they had some debates on the topic. And this is why they are opening the archives now of the, of the Pope. Uh, so it seems that if you're European, you must have a problem with the Holocaust. It's like a European norm. And this is not just coincidence, I suppose, that in the definition of being European, you must, you have a problem with with, with this dramatic past. But actually, there are two countries in Europe where there were no such debates. At least, I couldn't find any information about these debates. And you can guess what are these countries. Any hints? Russia. Russia and Belarus. And this is all the more so striking that, for me, Belarus actually is the head of the darkness of the Second World War. If, we, if, we, if you try to find the country most affected, most destroyed in human terms and material terms, that probably was Biela, Be, Soviet Belarus at that time. So one of the two countries that didn't have a debate, which shows that the debates on the Holocaust are not only related to the scale of the drama 80 years ago, but also to the social and political conditions and present. So to, to understand the coming to terms, we must think both about what happened, what was the experience of the local population during the Shoah, and what are the conditions of this coming to this today or in the 1990s or in the 1950s or 60s. Uh, please also note that I have listed practically all the countries of Europe, which means Germany itself and its allies, as well as enemies of, 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 of Germany, victims of, of the German aggression, or neutral countries like Switzerland or Sweden. So it somehow doesn't matter on which side of the, of the front line was a given country during the war. There is always a kind of problem with the, with the Shah, which transcends the wartime political and military division. So Poland is by no means unique, yet the frequency and intensity of the debates on the Holocaust in Poland in the last 30 years, even more than 30 years now, were really extraordinary. And in particular, Poland stands out among the post-communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe. In no other country of our region, we have seen so many and so intensive debates on the Holocaust. Uh, so in trying to understand this really unique intensity and frequency of debates, as a historian, I was looking back. And actually looking back, stepping back, I went down to the actual time of the Shoah. And I found that already in 1942, which is just a few months after mass killing of the Jews started after the, uh, the attack on the Soviet Union in June 1941, 
in the underground press, underground Polish press, and in the reports sent to London, to the Polish government in exile in London, we see both first attempts to find out what is going on, because many observers noted that the German anti-Jewish policy has changed, that there is something new in the German anti-Jewish policy. So the first attempt were to find out what is going on, and the second, how should we react? We, that is the non-Jewish Polish political leaders, underground organizations, and so on. And then I realized that there is a prehistory to it, namely that already in 1940, 1941, there was a kind of reflection in the underground and in London, in the Polish government exile, about what are the reactions of non-Jewish Poles to the persecution of Jews under German occupation. So, for example, one of the best-known actors of this story, the heroic secret emissary Jan Karski, who twice brought reports from the underground in Poland to the government exile, in one of his early reports wrote about the threat that there is a narrow bridge which can connect the German occupying administration with a part of the Polish population, and this is the anti-Jewish policy. So already he noted, and some other people noted, that there is a topic of the reaction of Christian Poles to the fate of, of Polish Jews. But clearly it became much more urgent when these observers realized that what's happening with the Jews and the German occupation is really extraordinary. And that was 1942. It took them some time, and this is understandable because each of the observers show only a small fragment of what was happening. There was no communication system. As you know, the perpetrators kept it secret, as secret as, the, as they could. So only gradually, after several months, we can see an emergence of an understanding that there is a major policy to kill all the Jews. Initially, the thought was it's a policy to kill East European Jews. But when the transports of Jews started coming from Western Europe and Southern Europe, the observers realized that this is about killing all the Jews in German-dominated Europe. So what we see already at this very early stage, when you have a parallel process of grasping the meaning of it and developing a response to it, we see differences of opinion. And I will give you just two examples. One is a, a very famous public statement called protest issued by an underground Catholic organization in 1942 during the deportation of the Warsaw Ghetto. Its author, Zofia kosak szczuska was a well-known writer and a person very close to the nationalist right in Poland, to the Endek Party, which we see in this document, in which, speaking on behalf, writing on behalf of her organization, she protested against unprecedented crimes committed on, on Polish Jews. So she protested against the crime. She wrote that no decent human being and no decent Christian, and she was stressing that she speaks as a Roman Catholic, can... Uh, can accept these crimes or make believe that there is a benefit out of it. However, at the same time, she wrote that, let me quote, our feelings towards the Jews have not changed. We don't stop thinking of them as political, economic, and ideological enemies of Poland. So in one document, you have a protest against mass crime committed against the Jews and expressions of anti-Jewish prejudice. And what is interesting, there is also a statement of that we cannot do Nothing. We are helpless in the face of the overwhelming power of, the, of, of Nazi Germany. The, you know, the front line was far away in, in, deep in the Soviet Union. So there is no call to help the Jews in this document. However, Ms. kosak Szczutska herself was one of the founders of Zagota, the underground organization that was established to help the Jews in hiding. So you have really an ambiguity between a personal activity of the author and the lack of a call to action in this document, which reflected differences of opinions in the underground. A part of the underground, especially the far right, accepted it that the Germans are solving the Jewish question for us. Another part of the underground said this is horrible, we must condemn it, but we cannot do much about it. We are helpless, we are ourselves persecuted. And another part said we must do something, we need to do something. So there was a variety of opinion already at that time, but of course, under conditions of occupations with very limited circulation of information on the illegal newspapers, some radio broadcasting from, from London, it was really fragmentary. But I stress it that it started, this coming to terms, 
started even before the crime had a name. Actually, the observers were trying to invent a name for this unprecedented crime which they were the eyewitness of. Uh, later on, later on in the uh, early post-war years, 1944-1947, roughly, we have the first series of debates on this topic in a relatively open conditions. No longer occupation. There is a censorship by the new communist government, but it's still conditions are not us in the Soviet Union. And especially after the Kielce pogrom of 1946, we have a series of articles written by the leading intellectuals of that time who are trying to understand what happened in Kielce, 42 people killed, but also connected to the non-Jewish Poles reactions to the fate of the Jews during the war. So this is the first open debate. And what is interesting, I'm not going to go into details, but some tropes, some you know, rhetoric strategies that were present in 1946 will come back again and again. So there is a certain continuity going 60 years, 70 years now ago, back. This, this, uh, uh, by the way, these discussions were parallel to the explosion of the documenting activity of the Polish Jewish survivors. The first historical research, well, not the first one, the first one was happening already during the war in the Onyx Shabbat archive, the, what Emanuel Ringelblum wrote exactly on this topic. His text on Polish-Jewish relations under German occupation is one of the first texts dealing with, with, the, with this topic. But we have this early, very intensive activity, especially in recording the accounts of the, of the survivors. And this largely ended in late 1940s when the Sovietization of Poland accelerated. So the Cold War began, Polish communists under heavy Soviet pressure accelerated, making Poland into Soviet-type country, and uh, practically all the debates ended. It was a highly uniform society, orders were coming from the top. And the question of the Shoah or the Holocaust, of course, none of these names were in use at that time, became marginal. However, it existed in the little ghetto of the Jewish Historical Institute, and there was also some commemoration with distortion, which I will come back in a second, what kind of distortion it was. But in general, there was this, there was this rather heavy-handed uh, enforced silence on, on the topic. Uh, paradoxically, the moment when the topic of Polish reactions to the Holocaust came, by, came, came back to the, to the fore was in 1968, in the most fortunate moment for it, that is during the so-called anti-Zionist campaign. Following the Six-Day War in the Near East and then the Student Rebellion in March 1968, the government uh, 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 responded with violence to the Youth Rebellion, but also with a, a propaganda campaign claiming that there was a Zionist conspiracy behind the Student Rebellion. So there was this, of course, the word Zionism was a fig leaf for openly anti-Jewish statement, but the question of how the Poles reacted to the Holocaust returned. But I said it was the least fortunate moment to talk about it. But again, we can see some of the rhetorical strategies used during the campaign, which we will see again now in the recent years. Uh, and then many years passed, actually, both for the Holocaust research and for the Jewish community in Poland, uh, uh, these were the bleakest years because after 68, the community was, was reduced to a trickle. Several thousand people only, uh, many prominent scholars left Poland. And only in the 1980s, things started to change. And this is clearly related to the broader process of the erosion of the communist regime and the emergence of the sphere of freedom of speech. That means along the first the emergence of the Solidarity Movement in 1980-81, and then after the martial law, when formally the, the trade union was crushed by General Jaruzelski, but the underground publishing uh, sphere remained. Quite often, the topics of Polish-Jewish history were coming back. And that was the background of the first debate, which I would like to mention, which followed the screening of Claude Lanzmann film Shoah, in Polish television and then a few cinemas. And again, Poland was the only communist country to show it, which is quite notable. Uh, of course, it was just a selection, 45 minutes shown on TV, but in a prime time. Mm -hmm. 
and the fragments shown were rather fragments showing Christian Paul's in a bad light with expression of prejudice and so on. So the most of the commentary in the, in the official legal media was rather negative, but we have some discussions both in the legally printed media and the underground press. Uh, it was, uh, it, it showed that there is certain emotional sensitivity about it because some of the statements were really emotional. It was not just about facts. It was very much about emotions, which we could see three years later, two years later, in 1987, when the first big full-size debate took place. And the debate started with an article published in the Catholic Weekly, Tygodnik Powszechny, in January 1987, by Professor Jan Błoński, a, prof a literary professor, who began his large article, by the way, Tygodnik Powszechny was one of the few independent weeklies between West Berlin and China, Chinese Sea. Uh, why? Because it was a Catholic weekly. So the communists tolerated the special niche, of course it was, there was a censorship, but the editors were not appointed by the party, which made it different to all the other uh, weeklies in, in, in Poland. So Boyski began his article with a reference to two poems written by Czesław Miłosz, at that time Nobel Prize winner living in California in exile, who in 1943 was in Warsaw, so he was the eyewitness of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and then the liquidation of the war, so the final destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto. And he wrote two poems published in 1944, and one of them, the title was Poor Christian Looks at the Ghetto, was transformed by Boinsky into the title of his article, and the title was Poor Paul's Look at the Ghetto. So Miłosz is interesting, because I realized it only on the plane here to Vienna, that his poem is one of these reactions to the Holocaust. It's one of the early attempts to come to terms with a crime that didn't have a name. Early one, by an eyewitness. And Miłosz, a young man at that time, expressed it as a deep existential anxiety. The poem is about a mole digging through ruins, an animal and the more clearly has features of a patriarch, Old Testament patriarch, or maybe God himself, and recognizes relics, ashes of dead people by a specter they have. And the poem ends with an expression of fear, of anxiety, that he may count me among the uncircumcised, the helpers of death. So, Poet was expressing the fear that by the fact of not being a victim, not being a Jew, he may be condemned. So that was truly prophetic, because this fear we see again and again coming in the Polish debates in the late 20th and 21st century. Notably, the change that Boinsky made, as uh, the title of the Miłosz poem was Poor Christian Looks at the Ghetto. The title of the article was Poor Paul's Look at the Ghetto. What Boinsky did, and nobody noticed at that time, it was many years later when Professor Andrzej Paczkowski noted and told me that for Miłosz, it was a transcendent problem of every individual, every Christian. I mean, he meant every non-Jew. He wouldn't say Aryan, but it was about the non-Jews. So individual and universal problem. Boinsky made it into collective and national problem of the Poles. It was plural, poor Poles look at the ghetto. So uh, uh, this is interesting because I suppose that this transformation of very individual, existential, and universal problem into something, and into a national Polish problem, added the emotional intensity to the debate and the following debates, because these debates were very much about who we are as Poles. They were about very much collective identity and the moral component of the collective identity. Uh, two years later, in 1989, as you may remember, Poland and the rest of Eastern Europe was busy with dismantling communist regime. 
But the next debate was somehow imposed on Poland, and that was the debate about the Carmel Monastery in Auschwitz. You remember a monastery which was established in the former building of the camp right outside the barbed wire of the main Auschwitz camp. The controversy started before, and it ended only in 1993 with the decision of the Pope John Paul II to move the nuns elsewhere, but 1989 was the most intensive year. However, that was a somehow different topic, and as you will see in these debates, we have two parallel topics coming again. One is about the Christian post reactions to the Holocaust, and the second is about what to do with Auschwitz. And in fact, who's Auschwitz? Who is the owner of Auschwitz? So that was 1989. In 1994, we had the anniversary of the Warsaw Uprising of 1944 the first big anniversary in non-communist Poland about an event when, which in communist Poland was downplayed, if not slandered. And during this anniversary, uh, uh, my colleague, historian, wrote a short review in Gazeta Wyborcza, the main national newspaper, about a book. But he mentioned that during the uprising, there were instances where, where Jews who left hiding during the uprising were killed by the Polish soldiers in the uprising. And it raised really intensive, mostly attack against him, how you dare to slander our, our heroes. Later on, it turned out that, yes, these were facts, as isolated by but, but facts. And the, so we have, again, the, the topic of Christian post reactions to the Holocaust. But there was an interesting step ahead. Boyski, Boyski article, his conclusion was a call for a moral compensation for Polish passivity during the Holocaust. He wrote that Polish Jews were dying a more lonely death they should have. So that was about passivity, not about killing. It was about insufficient help. Chiche article in 1994 was about killing. Small scale, a few people, but still killing. So it was a step in certain direction. Then we have, almost every year we have, 1995, at the liberation of Auschwitz, we have a controversy between Eli Wiesel and Lech Wałęsa, who is to speak first, you know, which group of victims is more important. Again, it was very much about who is the owner of Auschwitz as a symbol? Who has the power to make decisions about speakers, modes of commemoration, and so on? 1996, another anniversary of the Kielce pogrom, and again, controversy, what happened? What is the responsible? Why it was possible? 1996, 1997, we had a controversy about religious symbols in Birkenau. A group of young people, some Boy Scouts, put religious symbols, um, Catholic crosses, Christian Orthodox crosses, but also Stars of David, not far from the Birkenau camp, out of a goodwill kind of a syncretic way of commemoration. And that was the debate, should we put religious symbols in this place, and especially Christian symbols in this place? Uh, 1998, it escalated. Again, next to the building which was abandoned by the nuns, an association rented the building and started to put crosses. There was a rumor that Jewish organizations demanded the removal of a cross which the nuns left in this field, in the so-called pit. And there was a I would say semi-spontaneous movement to defend the cross, which has, you know, the term defensor crucis has a great tradition in, in Eastern Europe, as you, as you know, to defend the cross against the Jewish attempts to monopolize Auschwitz as the place of Jewish suffering. Uh, there was a great book about it by Genevieve Zubrzycki. It ended with the removal of most of the crosses except the one which remains. And you can ask me, during the questions and answers, because there is a beautiful history of this single cross afterwards. 1999, there was a complaint in the New York court, which was mostly about the restitution of property, but there was a long historical introduction, mostly absurd, claiming that there was a Polish conspiracy first to kill the Jews and then to take the, the property. <coughs> However, uh, uh, this, this didn't last long, but this is pr actually a third topic. In addition to the Polish reactions and what to do with, the, with Auschwitz, there is the topic of the victim's property and its restitution, which is unsolved to this moment. 
And finally, in late 1990s, there were minor discussions, which you probably haven't heard, but very interesting, about the opening of a shop, a kind of a supermarket or a shopping mall close to the Auschwitz Museum gate, and about a nightclub, a discotheque in the town of Oświęcim, which is the Polish name for Auschwitz. Very interesting, because it was about, can young people in the town of Oświęcim dance? Should they be allowed to dance? But finally, the biggest, most intensive, largest debate on the topic and on history in Poland in general was the debate that started in the year 2000 following the publication of a little book by Professor Jan Tomasz Gross. The title was Neighbors, and it was about the killing of the Jews in a small town of Jedwabne, today in eastern Poland. So as I said, that was the biggest debate on the past in Poland ever. We have some controversial topics like the communist regime, the secu communist security informers and the politicians and the working for the security, but this one was the biggest one, and bigger than any other discussion. And actually, that was the climax of the historical debates in Poland and the debates on the Holocaust in Poland, 2000-2002. So I will come back in a second to this, just let me continue with this chronology. Five years later, the same author published another book about the Kielce pogrom, the fear, and uh, again, six years later, uh, to, no, sorry, three years later, together with Irena Grudzińska Gross, they published a little book, Golden Harvest, about the mining of gold in the mass graves near the dead camp of Treblinka. So again, a rather horrible, horrible topic. So you have a series of the books by Jan Tomasz Gross, one really great debate, two smaller debates. Uh, and then it was relatively peaceful. A few years after the publication of the last book of Jan Tomasz Gross, there were some topics coming here and there, in particular when some uh, right-wing deputies in the Polish parliament introduced a legislation that was to penalize some statement on collaboration with Nazi Germany in Poland. But the real huge controversy on this topic erupted in early 2018, two years ago, when the government suddenly pushed through the parliament an amendment to the bill on the Institute of National Remembrance, which actually penalized claims on alleged complicity of the Polish nation or the Polish state in Nazi crimes. It penalized it with three years in jail, so rather serious story. And I'm sure you have heard about it because there was international controversy. Israeli government strongly criticized it. American government strongly criticized it. And the proponents of this bill actually preferred to present it as a Polish-Israeli controversy, which it wasn't. Because first of all, it was one more Polish-Polish controversy on this topic. So I happened to criticize this, but also Polish Historical Association, the Polish Society for Jewish Studies, practically everyone who has an idea of this history protested against this legislation. But the government pushed it through, the president signed it, and only six months later, under international pressure, the most controversial fragments were retracted. So they are no longer. However, the damage was done. And finally, it wasn't a big uh, national debate, but I mention it because there is a novel aspect to it. Before the uh, uh, elections to the European Parliament last year, we had a new political party, actually a federation of smaller parties of the far right, which made the topic of the restitution of the Jewish property the main topic of this ele electoral campaign. And specifically, they made this topic so-called Just Act, which is a resolution of the American Congress, which obliges American State Department to report about the progress of restitution in various countries. So there is a political movement which makes this topic the favorite topic and they are openly anti semitic actually they are proudly anti-Semitic. They are proud of the anti-Jewish prejudice. So this is, a, this is the uh, chronology. And now let me comment about it a little more. So we have these three topics. I will focus on the topics number one, which was the most often returning, which I would call the Poles face themselves. And I'm quoting because this phrase, we are facing ourselves, was coming again and again. But this is nonsense. This is some Poles living today 
facing some other Poles, mostly dead, who did or did not do something during the war. But this big we, that this is about us, is a major factor. That means there is the strong we of the Polish ethno-national community. And this big we, by the definition, excludes the victims. They are the objects of action or inaction of the we. Second, it shows a very strong, if not identity, solidarity with the past generations, and especially the generation of the Second World War. There is a very strong emotional bondage to the largely dead, the generation which passed away and was alive during the Second World War. Uh, how to understand it? So first, my claim is that at the bottom of the intensity and the emotionality of the debates is the act of watching itself. Namely, Poland and the rest of Eastern Europe, the area which Timothy Snyder called the bloodlands, where most of the killing of civilians took place in the 20th century, was also the scene of the Holocaust. It was not just the site where the Jews were killed massively or deported for killing, but this killing was an object of watching. Watching, hearing, and smelling. And it has consequences. Namely, well, most of the victims were Polish Jews. Some three million Polish Jews were killed, which makes most of the less than six million victims of the, of the Shoah. Moreover, about half of them were not killed in the dead camps, but on the spot, or died in the ghettos out of malnutrition before. Second, the killing, the experience of the so-called bystanders were different to Western Europe or even Southern Europe. The French or the Belgians or the Dutch or the Norwegians, they could see their Jewish neighbors being deported somewhere to the east. In Eastern Europe, very often people could see at a close range the fate of the Jews. And there is a price of such experience. Uh, Michael Steinlauf, my colleague from the United States, many years ago, already in the 1990s, noted that one of the leading American psychoanalysts, Robert J. Lifton, developed a theory about what happens to people who watch horrible death of someone else. Uh, uh, Jai Lifton uh, was working on the former prisoners of the Japanese camps of prisoners of war, uh, survivors of the, of the Nazi concentration camps. So he had a larger sample of people who survived horrible things, including horrible death of someone else. And he realized that the, the survivors have developed certain um, strategy to maintain a minimum of mental balance, not to get mad, which was distancing from the fate of the victims. But this distancing had an emotional price, which they paid later on, with convulsive emotions, and not necessarily empathy towards the victims. So Michael Steinlauf realized that in Eastern Europe, millions of people had such experience. Millions of people could see horrible deaths of other human beings at a close range. And maybe they also have this syndrome of former bystander. So I cannot prove it, but it seems to me it's likely. It's likely. So this is one. Second, if, if Shoah was an unprecedented crime, Watching it was also unprecedented experience. That means this is a topic for research which deserves attention. What are the consequences of not being a target of the persecution, but being very close to it? When I said smelling it, I mean it. Many years ago, making my field research in eastern Poland, I remember talking to an old peasant woman who lived nearby the village of Belzec. And he told me, when I asked her about the camp, what she remembers, she said, oh, you know, it was horrible. We couldn't open windows in summer because of the smell. I was so horrified. And then I realized that that was the most sincere account of reactions to the Holocaust. That means at the bottom of it, you have a very biological repulsion and fear. And other feelings come later. She lived about six kilometers away from the camp. So you have really people who sensorically were affected. Second, uh, Jay Lifton 
uh, noted that the process of healing from this traumatic experience takes time and under certain conditions may be suppressed. And clearly, communist regime is not, does not produce good conditions for emotional healing after apocalyptic events. Why? Because it's blocking free conversation. People are afraid of talking many things. And the way out of, of this post-traumatic uh, conditions is finding a meaning in it, finding a way out of, the, of, this, of this emotional prison. So, uh, indeed, for many years, uh, as I said, there were no conditions. They started only in the 1980s. And in the 1980s, we really see the emotional aspect of this. Especially the Boinsky debate, 1987, it was not so much about historical facts. It, about, it was about the moral judgment. It was really soul-searching. In a Catholic newspaper, very much in Catholic terms, with terms like sin, salvation, and very much about meaning. Historians were called later on. Only during the Yedwabne debate, they played the key role. But at the beginning, it was very much about the moral judgment and the, and the meaning of the story. Second, Poland between late 1940s and 1980s was not just Poland under the communist regime. It was also Poland with few Jews. Some 300,000 Polish Jews survived the war, but 90% of them emigrated from Poland. And the biggest wave emigrated right after the war, especially after the Kielce pogrom, massively left. Which means there were few people to tell the story of war from a Jewish perspective. And private narratives under the communist regime are important because they are more trusted than the official narrative in the newspaper or in the textbook. And that was missing. There were few Jews to tell the story. Actually, it was easier to learn the story in New York, Melbourne, or Tel Aviv than than in Warsaw. Third is, as I said, there was a kind of not so much organized oblivion. This is a term which one of the scholars of the Soviet memory of the Holocaust introduced, that there was an organized oblivion. You see many monuments in the former Soviet Union when the victims are presented as innocent civilians. That means there is no mention that they were Jews. In Poland, it was not the case. Actually, we have a number of monuments which are very clear show, if not tell, that the victims were Jewish. So the Holocaust was marginalized in the textbooks, in the official narrative, but not in the works of art. And in particular, we have a number of very powerful literary works, like Borowski novels about Auschwitz, or Naukowska medallions, really some of the most powerful prose on the experience of war written in Polish right after the war, which were part of the school curricula. This is how I learned about it, from these novels. So it was present, not in the official narrative of history, but it was present in, 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 in the arts. And finally, Poland was a center for Holocaust research. It was in this little ghetto of the Jewish Historical Institute, but it remained after 68, it almost collapsed. But then in the 1980s, it started to revive. The, the Polish Jewish history, in the 1980s started to grow, and in the 1990s, practically late 1990s, at every Polish major university was some kind of Jewish studies. So it was a, a renewal of, of studies of, of, uh, of research. And there was a feedback mechanism between the research and public debates. Most of the debates that I mentioned began with a text by a scholar, be it Jan Błoński or Jan Tomasz Gross. So uh, there, was a, there was a flow of ideas between the academia, the ivory tower, and the, and, and the public debate, which was important. So uh, uh, two more aspects is the role of the church. Before Vaticanum Secundum, the Jan Boyski article and the debate about Yedwabne was not possible in Poland. It required a major change of the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church on Judaism and the relation to the Jews and in particular, the role of John Paul II in this change. So uh, I, I cannot imagine the Jan Boinsky article and the debate that followed without John Paul II and the change in the Roman Catholic Church. And second, some of the books of Jan Tomasz Gross and also the article of Boinsky were published by Catholic publishers. But also some of the greatest opponents of them were in the Roman Catholic Church, especially kind of a center of this opposition was uh, the media conglomerate of Father Rydzyk, Radio Maria, 
and his newspaper and television. So it's, it's, this is, these were the debates, the Polish-Polish debates, these were also debates among Polish Catholics. And finally, I have it is just uh, maybe a feeling that maybe not for the general public, but for Polish intelligentsia, the educated class. Jewish history and the histories of the Holocaust is more important. Why? Because intelligentsia of Jewish origin made really a large part of the educated classes before the Second World War. Half of the Polish doctors and half of the lawyers were Jewish. So maybe not among the peasants or workers, but certainly among intelligentsia, Jews were not a distant someone. It was someone close, and many outstanding writers, poets, musicians, and so on, were Jewish, or at least of Jewish origin, if they were assimilated. Well, so finally, uh, because I'm running out of my time, let me close with certain comments. As I said, already during the Yedwabne debate, we could see a backlash. That means the increasingly irritated voices of people who claimed that this is too much that they were ready to admit that maybe, yes, we could help a little bit more under the horrible conditions of war, but claiming that we, the victims of the Nazi aggression, the nation who was fighting from the first day of war to the last day of war, were complicit in the Holocaust. That's too much. We cannot accept it. And these voices started to grow already in the early 2000s. And with each book of Professor Gross, they were uh, louder. But I believe that uh, actually the, there was, they even invaded a certain term, the pedagogy of shame. They claim that these books are to force posts into a guilty feelings, feeling of guilt, to make a great mental reform of Poland and maybe extract some political and financial profits. However, I believe that the key factor that made this backlash more powerful was a coincidence. History is coincidental. This is how I see it. And the coincidence was about 2010, we had a revolution in communications. In 2006, Google bought YouTube and started expanding it. And very soon, in a few months, millions of people started using it, including in Poland. Polish Twitter became available in 2007, and Polish Facebook in 2008. And all the debates in the last decade are no longer in the printed newspapers and magazines. They are on social media, which completely changes the rules of the game, so to speak. Because social media clearly favor some kind of content. The algorithms are to maximize the attention and time we spend watching them because we can be affected by the advertisement. So the, these algorithms, and there are some studies about it, favor highly emotional content, controversial content, fake news, conspiracy theories, which spread faster than reliable information. So today, if you come with a statement which is moderate, thoughtful, and balanced, you must lose. If you say something horrible, emotional and controversial, millions of people will see what you have posted. Second, this is very much a visual culture. The debates that I have mentioned were about words, printed words. Now it's very much about memes, images. And the discussion with images is different to the discussion with words. So we have uh, something which affects all aspects of life, and this is not incidental that we have strong political polarization, not only in my country, but also in the US, Great Britain, and many other countries. In Polish case is that the cultural war, which we see in various countries, is very much about the past. Not only about the Polish Jewish past, because for example, the history of solidarity, the role of Lech Wałęsa, or what was the meaning of the changes in 1989, are equally controversial. But it's something very Polish that history makes the major part of the, of the cultural conflict. So in the last years, we see that the backlash against this tendency to come to terms with the Holocaust, first speaking in moral terms, then calling historians to investigate and find out details. And there was an incredible progress 
in Holocaust research in Poland. Really, Poland became one of the leading centers of the, of the, of the Holocaust research, which still maybe not satisfactory, but the progress was dramatic. So this tendency generated a backlash, and this backlash found a very conducive conditions online. So now it seems to me that the people who don't like the tendency that I have described have the upper hand, and they will have it as long as we keep discussing on Facebook. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. If you if you want, you can sit down. So as you as okay. you prefer. <laughs> um, oh, very very inspiring uh, ideas, and thank you very much for this great uh, summary of the uh, Polish developments. Uh, we will collect soon the questions, but first I would like to ask you what is uh, unique in the po uh, in the development of of Polish politics of history or memory politics or I don't know how we can call it. Um, I'm in a difficult position because as a historian for many years I was calling everybody to pay attention to history. Basically pay attention to what I write, right? It was quite... <laughs> uh, because it seems that unfortunately my wife says beware of what you dream of because it may happen. <laughs> It has happened. We have a government which really cares about history. Unfortunately, we have a government which cares about history in a way which I cannot accept. That means it wants to have a uniform narrative of a glorious national past, which simply didn't happen. I'm not against glorifying heroes. You know, heroes are a few people. It's a great European tradition to have monuments and have heroes from time to time, but it's not the full history. So I, I strongly oppose attempts to silence, like the 2018 Act on Holocaust Complicity, which was basically to silence historians. I cannot accept harassing of my colleagues in, 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 in Holocaust research. And I, I cannot accept a you know, highly simplified, read excessively simplified, a vision of the past which is, which is childish, is not emotionally mature. And I, I suppose that even, even the children of the people who now uh, uh, perform this propaganda will not trust it. So beware of what you dream. Uh, uh, however, uh, thanks to this, there is this large stream of cash flowing to research, but I am afraid the quality of this research will not be superior. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is a dilemma, how to protect the stream of money for research uh, but remove the attempts of political control of how the, the money is used. Okay. If you have any question, I would be yeah. happy to answer. Sorry, um, you mentioned the, the sensational content on the um, the social media and the the use of use of images, um, and I was wondering um, if these images are showing Poles doing bad things in World War II or watching bad things happen. Um, don't they kind of function against that whole stream, or are there claims that these are faked photographs or? Or did I, did I misunderstand the, the function of the photographs? Uh, you know, I was, in terms of, not just photographs, it can be drawings, uh -huh. it can be edited photographs. Mm -hmm. For example, the photograph of a field full of crosses, wooden crosses, symbol of martyrdom, coming from the discussion 1998, when the self-proclaimed group of the defenders of the cross uh, made a kind of a scandalous performance in Auschwitz. That was very much visual. Uh, but I also have in mind a drawing of uh, two executioners pointing guns at the kneeling man. One has a swastika on his arm and another has a red star, but this is a Star of David, not the Soviet star. And that was published in one of the 
major newspapers in, in, in Poland. You know, it's very difficult to discuss with images. They don't argue, they tell, they show you something. Uh, second, if you don't like it, you will not see it. Because Facebook will show you only what you want to see, or you will react emotionally. But there are many other people who will not see what you see. So you have the bubbles. And the precondition for discussion is we know what other people think. So I'm not sure we know now. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to go back to some of the terms that you used during your lecture, specifically coming to terms. What exactly is that supposed to mean? Because uh, you uh, actually gather under these concepts uh, perspectives and positionalities very different from one another, from uh, critical historical research to um, actually well, uh, in, at the very beginning, think, simply thinking about Polish passivity. So I would like you to elaborate maybe a little bit more on, on what, what the term means. But also on other terms that, um, as far as I know, are being uh, debated uh, in Poland among uh, scholars, so, sociologists, political science scholars, historians. And uh, I mean here the notion of uh, bystandership which is being contested uh, for some time now, but also traumatization. Uh, by the Holocaust, uh, you draw from Steinlauf. His book was published in the 90s, and, and you yourself said that there was a lot of historical research that, that changed the perception of, uh, on the positionality of Poles vis-à-vis -vis the Holocaust. So the question is whether, because of these changes in research, we should not also reconsider the, the concepts in which we think about this positionality. Thank you very much uh, for these advanced questions, very good questions. I will start with the second one. Namely, um, to my knowledge, all the research in the past 20 years, it expanded our understanding and knowledge about the catalogue of behaviour of non-Jewish Poles, in particular focusing on uh, active betrayal exploiting helpless victims, collaboration with the German administration. And not so much about the, those uh, Christian Poles who didn't do anything specific or we don't know if they did something specific. I believe that those who did something in reaction to the Holocaust, be it active help or active harassment of Jews, were a minority. The intellectual challenge and the challenge for, for research is to find out something about the passive majority. And passivity doesn't mean indifference. So we have to develop a story out of silence, ex silencio. When someone said something or did something, it's relatively easy. But what about those who didn't say, or we never had, had any record of what they said or what they did? And for this group, the comments of Steinlauf are valid as they were. You have a group of people who we know they saw something, and that's it. Because the act of seeing is unquestionable. While acting, you must have a proof of an act, a proof of a statement. So I, I think it remains valid. Moreover, the fact that Jan Tomasz Gross ignored Steinlauf's book in his book Fear. This is the striking, missing, the most important book on the same topic was not mentioned in his book, uh, which was a, was a shock for me. For me, it was a sign that somehow he didn't have a proper answer to this, to this claim. So I believe that Steinlauf, 20 years later, I, 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 at least I don't know, if anyone has revised his very broad terms. That was not a specific, that was just an observation. And the question of my understanding of coming to terms, uh, I use this English term, I'm not a native English speaker, but I use this term as a certain kind of a reactions to the Holocaust. You have the, the initial reactions, actually the, the actual reactions to someone sees something and is reacting. And that may be unconscious, it doesn't have to be thoughtful. Coming to terms is thoughtful. 
people later on think about it. What should be the response? How should I judge it? What it was? What am I to do with this past now? This is for me the coming to terms. I hope it's not very unclear. Okay, so uh, I was just coming back to, uh, to Steinlauf because I actually spent a lot of time with him and uh, also drawing from, uh, from Elżbieta Janicka and he, her criticism or her actually active dialogue with Steinlauf around his conceptualization of, of Polish response to the Holocaust as a trauma of the witness. And actually, uh, it's quite striking that uh, Steinlauf introduces his conceptualization because he does not know what to do with the empirical material that he encounters. He's just so troubled by the question of how could anti-Semitism survive uh, in a country where uh, the Holocaust were, was perpetrated, and he is doing his best to explain it away on the basis of, of, of theory which does not necessarily hold in this context because the, the answer could just as well be Poles are violent towards the victims of the Holocaust in the aftermath of the Holocaust because they were not traumatized by the Holocaust at all. Yes, but I was not talking about it. Okay? The, 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 the motivation for post-war anti-Jewish violence was not the topic of my presentation. And I know the article of, of, of uh, Dr. Janicka. I disagree with her on most on, on, on topics. Uh, to my knowledge, no one has offered an alternative interpretation of what could have happened to people who saw horrible scenes at a close range. There is an answer, nothing. Okay, so we have just an empty page. There is no coming to... Nothing has happened. They didn't react. There was no emotional consequences to it. And all the Polish debates on the Holocaust have different reasons. Uh, I don't find it plausible. Um, it's, not to, it's not to minimize the degree of complicity or collaboration. No. You have a, you have a, a country of some... 20 million inhabitants at that time, maybe 19, because some of them were deported. Uh, so there was a variety of reactions, and we can find uh, um, uh, people who um, didn't notice or, or didn't register what they noticed. So Janicka's argument is that you, if you have in many Polish memoirs, there is nothing written about it, is a proof that they didn't notice is exactly an argument ex silencio. Okay, this is the logic weakness of it. Maybe she's right, but this is not a proof. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your lecture, Mr. Stola. Um, my question um, concerns the, uh, all the many memorial sites that there are in Poland. Um, because memorial sites are they're, they're very flexible, they're reproduced uh, every year by human beings, um, and they are also a mirror of, of what society is nowadays. So I'm wondering the backlash that you describe, uh, would you say that it has already affected um, all the various memorial sites like uh, the State Museum of Auschwitz-Birkenau or the State Museum of Majdanek uh, and so forth? A very good question, actually. I, recently, I talked about it uh, because I met a group of people who uh, were speaking about the local initiatives to commemorate. And why we have this backlash, which I would say are the, the central backlash against the main narratives. There is an ongoing effort in dozens, if not hundreds of localities for new forms of commemoration. And these are local initiatives. So it seems that you have parallelly existing process of a different nature, which is nothing unusual. That some people do one thing and some people do, do the other. Uh, that means this effort, local initiatives to commemorate, they continue in various places. I haven't seen any slowdown. There were attempts to remove the director of the Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum in 2018 and recently, and they failed. So Piotr Siewiński remains the director. 
the, the, the only change with Auschwitz Museum was that the International uh, Council, uh, its term ended two years ago now, and it was not appointed for the new term. So in fact, it was as if liquidated. I was a member of it. Uh, it's really a big mistake because the International Auschwitz Council was a council to the Prime Minister of Poland. So it was not a regular advisory council to the director of, of the Auschwitz Museum because it also was expressing opinions on other uh, memorials of the death camps. And not only, for example, on the Płaszów concentration camp in, in Krakow. So it was a forum for debate. There were representatives of Yad Vashem, Holocaust Museum in Washington, uh, Roma organizations, historians, uh, uh, and also a buffer uh, which was protecting uh, um, the Auschwitz Museum from a new controversies. The council was established in 2001 following the uh, crosses uh, controversy, and it worked very well because since 2001 we haven't had any major controversy about Auschwitz. And in the 1990s, almost every year we had one. So it was quite an effective mechanism. So in this sense, the museum is less protected than it was because the council was a kind of a shield against political interference. But uh, it hasn't changed for the time being. To my knowledge, nothing has changed in other places. There is an ongoing project to build a new memorial and museum in uh, Sobibur. But uh, no political interference. Well, other than absence of the Russian members of the committee. That was clearly political, that the Russians were not invited. But it may change. The nature of the, the, nature of the um, present government of Poland and its cultural revolution, because it declares certain cultural revolution, is radicalizing. That means what was acceptable a year ago may not be acceptable six months from now. Um, thank you for your very uh, illuminating talk. Um, during your uh, presentation, you were suggesting that you may ask you about the one cross that remains next to uh, the Auschwitz Memorial, and I wondered if you would still be willing to share that. Yes, with um, us. No, I like this story because it shows the power of practical action and the weakness of thinking. <laughs> Namely, when the nuns left the building of the so-called Old Theater, they left a single cross, a wooden, big wooden cross standing close to the barbed wire of the, of the camp. And this, the, the sight of this cross for the visitors, especially Jewish visitors of the camp, was sometimes irritating, kind of a dominating Christian symbols in this place. So there was some, some criticism of it, which led to this... Uh, movement to defend the cross in 1998. And then the crosses were, all other crosses were removed. This cross remained. And I thought at that time that there is no solution for it. That because Auschwitz camp, Auschwitz-Birkenau camp had a double nature, at least two, two functions. One, it was the largest Nazi concentration camp and it was also the largest dead camp. It's very difficult to separate Jewish ashes from non-Jewish ashes, even if Jews made 90% of the victims of the camp, killed victims. So there should be room for commemoration and grief of the families of all the victims. And I didn't see how to solve it. Should we forbid Christians because there's a Christian tradition to put a cross on a cemetery. Should we forbid symbols? Actually, under the communist regime, we, we, this is interesting, because nobody noticed for 40 years of communist regime that they prevented erection of religious symbols in Auschwitz. As communists, they didn't like it. Later on, when the system was eroding, the first cross appeared in the cell of Father uh, Kolbe. So there was a communist solution to it, simply. Uh, but... Uh, what is the power of practice against the weakness of, of, of the mind? I thought there is no solution. I don't know how to solve it. And then someone found a solution. That was probably a gardener. A group of trees were planted 
around the cross. And now you can see it only from the street, you cannot see it from the camp. So something which doesn't have a philosophical solution may have a solution in gardening. <laughs> there was a rebellion in Sobibur, which was to some extent even successful, to some extent. Was there tried a similar things in the other camps, at least tried, or nothing at all? So was, was in this sense Sobibur unique? Well, it was unique because I said it was successful, but the, the, the most known case of a rebellion is the rebellion, of the, is the rebellion in the Birkenau. It, yes, but it failed, of course. Uh, an attempt at it. Uh, with, with Sobibor, I mentioned, and, and I'm glad that you said, because the, the leading role in the Sobibor rebellion was the, was the Soviet prisoners, Soviet Jewish prisoners of war, who were there, and maybe you have seen the Russian film produced, a few, I think, two years ago or three years ago on, on Sobibor. No, no. So, uh, so uh, it was, uh, as you said, relatively successful because a few hundred people tried to escape and a few dozen survived. Oh, there were 600 people, according to the study, and 400 were shot, but 200 escaped. Yes, but eventually a few dozen, I think 60 or 70, managed to survive finally. In the end. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, first, 200 came out of Yes. But in the forest, others mm -hmm. were killed. And mm -hmm. so Yes, so this is why I, it's, I'm, it's really a pity that there is no a, a Russian representative on the on the committee of the of the um, this project memorial project in, in Sobibor because uh, uh, in the sense Russians had an important role in this in this history, but as far as I know, it was uh, a consequence of the annexation of Crimea and the war in Donbass and also shooting down of the Dutch plane in. In, in eastern Ukraine, as you know. So you have international political conflicts that affect commemoration in, in ways which, we, which I, not wel I don't welcome them. It's, it's really a pity. Uh, uh, but it's, uh, for me, it's a, it's a beautiful example showing to what extent uh, commemoration of the Holocaust is, uh, we want it or not, connected to ongoing political conflicts. So we start, you, you, start, you started your presentations with the very important um, point or declaration that it was a European, a European history. And it is also a kind of European conflict of memory politics. And then you um, reconstructed this long history of memory politics uh, with a different periods, steps, activities, uh, political context, and so on. My question is rather uh, at this meta level of history. How do you see now? It's a back, 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 backslash to the very, very early 40s, or it's a kind of circulation, or circulus viciosus, or it is just um, commemoration at work, so nobody knows what will happen because the Russian uh, politics of history is also act extremely active. Uh, the Western European memory politics ha have also some turns. So how do you see now this huge arena of European or Euro-Asian uh, um, memory polit politics or, or politics of history of the Holocaust? It's just reckoning of the past or it goes to redefine the European future itself? Uh, I believe that we are in a new stage of it. And actually, I have a beautiful exhibit for this claim. Uh, two months ago, nobody else but Vladimir Putin, uh, in the head of a major power, speaking to the heads of the post-Soviet countries, made a 40-minute lecture on the history of Poland. No such thing ever happened. 
you know, I really, uh, you, you find it online. Vladimir Vladimirovich speaking on, on Polish history, 40 minutes. Mostly blaming Poland for the beginning of the Second World War and anti-Semitism. So all those of you who fight against anti-Semitism now have a beautiful ally. Uh, it clearly was the beginning of a major disinformation campaign. And uh, as you may have heard, led to the absence of Polish president in Jerusalem at the International Holocaust Forum in January. Uh, but it was also uh, an example that, unfortunately, as I said, politicians started to pay attention to history. But not in a way I would welcome. Clearly, it was bad history. The lecture of President Putin was a bad lecture. You can easily challenge what he said. Um, now I'm trying to look at the bright side of life, there are positive aspects always, and maybe he was lying, but still he was attracting attention of many people to the past. So maybe they will read some important books. However, I am afraid that this will not happen, and I have an evidence of it this morning, riding taxi to the Warsaw Airport. I took a taxi, and I had a call, I was talking with a colleague, and then the driver said, oh, so you're a historian. <laughs> yes. Uh, could you please tell me, you know, people say different things about this Yedwabne story. So how it was? Did really Poles kill Jews in the Yedwabne? And I said, you know, yes, I, I did some reading about it. So I spent the rest of my trip. <laughs> so we have heavy traffic in Warsaw. I had some 10 minutes for the lecture, or 15 maybe. But what was clear for me, that it was, he was a good will person, who really wanted to understand something. And 20 years after this big debate, he was confused. I am afraid that the confusion is the present and the next stage. That means you have a cacophony of voices. You have a very postmodern situation. We are in a post-postmodern stage, but Historical debates are postmodern in the sense that there are narratives as if there was no past before them. And people who happen not to be a history professor may be confused. So, uh, and in the sense, the, 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 the lecture of Vladimir Putin was not irrational. It was not to make everybody believe that Poland was guilty for the beginning of the Second World War. But it was, it was to make many people confused. So how it really? So far we have heard that Poland was the first victim of German aggression. But maybe it wasn't true. I'm afraid that this is the, this is the next stage. That means this is a stage not leading to a shared conclusion, a shared knowledge, but many bubbles with very different and sometimes strange opinions each being fed with information which is easy to produce, anyone can produce it. So I'm, I'm not very optimistic. So, sorry, do you know the difference between a pessimist and an optimist? In Warsaw? In Warsaw, a pessimist says, oh, it's bad, it's horrible, it cannot be worse. And an optimist says, of course it can be worse. Beautiful last word, I guess. So thank you so much again for the presentation. And the Q and A. And we, as I, I, I switch into German, uh, we have an another program uh, im Institut und. Oh, obwohl wir noch nicht sicher sind, welche Programme wir richtig ha halten können, ich würde Sie trotzdem äh, für eine VW in Weiz äh, äh, zu invitieren. Und es geht um äh, Children and Grandchildren of the Holocaust Perpetrators in, Lit in Lithuania. Äh, Rasha Balochkeit, äh, a research fellow of the Institute, will äh, take, äh, äh, give a lecture in our house. Äh, äh, wieder auf Deutsch, 19. März um 3 Uhr. Also herzlich willkommen äh, äh, zu uns. Vielen Dank für das Kommen und schönen Abend noch.